Our next speaker is Joachim Sundin. He is a consultant and agile coach who worked with a half a dozen different leadership management teams and delivery teams. He is frequently speaking and training on topics such as agile at scale, Spotify, empowered product teams and organization, agile leadership and strategy, and furthermore, he's also the co-author of Kanban in Action. Have you ever wondered what is the biggest difference between great product companies and not so great one? So in his talk, Beyond Scrum, how the best is different from the rest, he will provide you with the answer in his experience. So welcome to the stage, Joachim Sundin. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you can. I can hear me. Right, uh, great to be here. Um, I'm going to throw myself right at it uh, and uh, say that I need your help. So, uh, trying to do this a little bit interactive from the start. So, I have a problem. What should we build? I don't know. What should we build? So, imagine that I'm working at uh, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft uh, Networks, Amazon's uh, real estate page. We've just hired an agency, an external company, to produce some different designs for our search widget. Uh, we want to make a new and nice one. So the, the thing is that we will, uh, people will use it to find partner sites that we will earn a referral fee from. So we have these six different designs. The, the first one at the top left, it's the already existing one, and then five others. So which one should we choose? Does it matter? How would you decide if it was you? How would you make the decision? Anyone? Just throw it out. Sorry? By design. By design. So the, the one that looks nicest or... Anyone else? If, you were, if it was on your team? Yeah, we have a hand here. It depends on, on what we're going for and how people will use it. Okay. Uh, any other suggestions? Test. test. How would we test it? Give it to users. Give it to users. Okay. And then what? Yeah. Ask them for some feedback and so on. Yeah, maybe. That's a pretty typical Scrum team exercise. You would maybe have some prototypes and, and uh, do a demo or ask some users about it. So what, uh, what they actually did was to run an A-B test. Do you know what an A-B test is? Yeah, you know, it's quite expensive to, to build software and deploy it and operate it and so on. So we would rather not uh, have to build all the solutions in order to test them. So uh, we would do a simple prototype uh, known as the, the treatment. So the, I don't know if you can make it out, but the top left one says control. So that's the incumbent. That's the current uh, solution. And the other five are different options. And actually put them out. So some percentage of people coming to the site would get uh, number one, some would get number two, some would get number three, and so on. And then they would do, as you suggested, you know, what, what are we actually optimizing for? Well, we want to be me more people to click through and uh, actually you know, use the real estate agents and, and we will get a kickback, right? So if we can increase the click through, that would be great. Um, but if you couldn't do that, so, so which one would you guess? Which one, which one is the best here? Which one is the, is the winner? So just a quick show of hands. I'm going to give you five seconds to think which one, and then I'm going to go through each of them. So the top left, the control group, how many of you think that's the winner? Uh, not, not, not that many hands. OK, the top right one, treatment one. Uh, a few hands. Treatment two on the left in the middle. Yeah, a couple of hands, uh, or a few hands. Uh, treatment three, the right one in the middle row. Yeah, more hands. Uh, treatment four, the bottom left. Wow, lots of hands. And treatment five, 
Uh, some fewer. Okay, so, so anyone who said treatment four, that had the most uh, uh, show of hands. Why, why did you pick treatment four? Looks nice. Yeah. That's simple. That's a great criteria. So they actually had a contest uh, with the agency that, that built uh, these uh, creative des designs. And uh, they got to vote, the, the designers, a group of 21 people. And three of them actually picked the right one. 18 of the designers picked the wrong one. And they're the experts. So uh, it was actually treatment number five, the one on the top or bottom right corner. Uh, the people said it looked more like a search experience. And it actually um, increased revenue from referrals by 10%. So it made a huge difference uh, compared to the others. Okay, let's, let's uh, try another one. So uh, back in the day when you came to the MSN homepage and uh, you were a Hotmail user, you can see on the right side there it would open up a, a small widget for Hotmail. Okay, you see you have new unread emails. Uh, so I click the widget. Okay, should, should we now open Hotmail in the same window or in a new tab? So how many of you say in the same window? Well, some. And in a tab, in a new tab. More. And, and this was at a time when, when this was kind of new uh, with the tabs. And uh, there was a, a guy in the UK at Microsoft who proposed that we, we should do that. We should, we should open it in a new tab. Uh, because then once people actually have finished reading their email and close the tab, they're back at, at the, the page. But if we open it in the same, uh, then, uh, you know, when they close the tab, they won't be back to, to the Amazon homepage. But they had a very hard time convincing people that, that this was the right choice, and everyone voted against it. But they were able to run an A-B test uh, with uh, almost one million users. And it turned out that the home page engagement increased by almost 9%. And uh, they, uh, st some people still didn't trust it, and uh, they rolled it out even more, and, and it was a success, and they rolled it out in the rest of the world. And that's actually the, the single biggest, the single best way to increase engagement on the Amazon homepage in all their history. And it only required a few lines of code to change. But most people didn't think it was a good idea. OK, this one then. So on the left, we have uh, you know, Buy Me 20, 2007 Office System today. And there is a, a small button where you can click for more. And then you have the new suggestion on the right with a big Buy Now button and the price. And all in the red is, is a clickable surface. So which one do you think uh, is the best in terms of click-through? How many people actually click uh, the button to, to the next page? For, do you think the left one, the existing one, was the winner? Raise your hand. Do you think it was the other one? Yeah, the other one. Why? Yeah, it's much more prominent, much more easier, much better. Uh, but it actually turns out that uh, uh, the one on the left was far more successful, but a much, much higher click-through. So that was the winner. Uh, it actually had 64% uh, fewer users, the one on the right. So our intuition is not that great in, in telling us which one is, is the better one. Which search header? The one with the uh, looking glass, or the one that says live search? How many do you think, uh, the, the top one, how many think that's the best one? Yeah, some hands. And the bottom one? Uh, so a lot of you seem undecided, but OK. So it's actually the bottom one. You were right. Uh, and uh, Good designers, Steve Krug, for instance, if you know his seminal work, Don't Make Me Think, on, on good uh, user experience and user design. He says it's great to have an actionable verb like search 
and that one performed better, but it was just slightly better actually, but it did uh, statistically uh, significant perform better. Okay, so just one more on the same theme. So similar, changing the looking glass to search. How many of you think the top one is the best? And how many think the bottom one is the best? I mean, I just told you, right? It's an actionable verb. But no, there was no difference, no significant difference whatsoever. It didn't matter what they did. Okay, last one. Which text color in Bing search results? So, you know, the search engine, we, we search and then it shows a lot of search results. Should we have the, the existing colors on the left or the colors on the right? You don't see a lot of difference, probably. And, and so did most designers or, or uh, people who looked at it. They said it's, it's not a big difference. So which one did you, do you think? How many think the control group? How many think the other group? How many think that it didn't matter? OK. So it turns out that users who saw slightly darker blues and greens in titles and slightly lighter black in captions were successful in their searches a larger percentage of the time and those who found and those who found what they wanted did so in significantly less time so it it actually when when they put it out it 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 flagged this too good to be be true alert that they thought something was wrong with their tests so they increased it to testing 32 million users because there were a lot of designers and others who were really skeptical and, and, and wanted to disregard this result. But it showed consistently that it was much better. And when they rolled it out to all users, the color changes boosted revenue by more than $10 million annually. So I think we showed that you don't know what will work unfortunately, sorry, but neither do the experts. And some of these examples, or actually all of them, were, were from, from this book, Trustworthy Online Controlled Experiments. And it says that the vast majority of new ideas fail in experiments. Even experts often misjudge which, which one will pay off. At Google and Bing, about 10 to 20% of experiments generate positive results. At Microsoft as a whole, one third prove effective. One third has neutral results. It doesn't matter, we, we did it unnecessarily. And one third have negative results. So if you don't know for sure how your changes are performing, unless you're much better than Microsoft and Google, there's a high chance that it doesn't matter and a too high chance or risk that it actually has a negative result. Not only did you waste time on building this feature, it, it's actually hurting you that you did that. Sometimes I meet with clients and, and talk to organizations and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, this end consumer things and, and it's, it's different, uh, that doesn't apply to us and we have this three year long backlog, we know that we need to do that. It's just obvious, it's table stakes, and we, we talk to the customers, or we talk to our internal users, and we know that they want this. Sure, if you, if you ask me on New Year's Day, every year, do you, do you need a gym card? Oh yeah, this year, oh man. <laughs> if you ask me in April, how did that go with the gym card? Well, I worked out a lot the first week of January, and then it's kind of dwindled. So users, customers suck at predicting their own uh, behaviors. Uh, the joke is, uh, I think it's, it's been credited to Steve Jobs, but I'm not sure, that users don't know what they want until they see it, and then they know it's something else they want, something different. You know, we, we have these um, focus groups of, of consumer testing I don't remember what it was, some kind of a boom box machine, and, and they, they had it in two different colors, a black one and a pink one. And all the, the user tests uh, in the focus groups, they said, oh, the pink one is so, so cool and it really stands out. I would definitely prefer, prefer the pink one. And then when they left, they had the, the chance to get one. They could pick one. Everyone picked the black. 
They were just saying that the pink one was much better than they would prefer that one, and they ended up picking the black. Another test where they said, yes, we'll buy that, that boom box. Um, and uh, definitely, I would really love one. And then they got offered when they left, uh, do you want it or uh, a check for what it's worth? I'll have the check, please. So yeah, you should listen to users, but not really to exactly what they're saying. You probably heard uh, some of you the Henry Ford quote, if I would have asked my users or customers, they would have said, faster horses. But he listened to what they were really saying, and, and he gave them cars. Yeah, so uh, a lot of our solutions are useless. You can see this Standish group that's been done again and again and again through the years with thousands of companies. And uh, often it shows results like features are rarely or even ever, nev never used. So there's a lot of waste. And I think this is probably one of the biggest wastes in our industry in software development, that we build a lot of stuff that we have really no idea if it's working or not. So wh why is this so? How come? Well, how come that we're you know, in this VUCA world? Uh, you heard Niels talk about it previously, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. It's like a, a white water rapid. We have to swim through to get to the other side and figure out, are we going in the right direction? And we put on blindfolds. We don't follow up. We don't do A-B tests. We don't test things. We're just having a Hail Mary and hoping that, yeah, but we talked to the users or someone on the business side said this, so this is what we have to do. But the sad news in many organizations that I work with it's not only that you know, they swim like crazy and they get to the other side. They don't even check, am I in the right spot? They're too, too busy you know, running to throw themselves in the next river uh, and start swimming, because that's what they're being instructed to do, right? So I think I really try to get people to open up their eyes. You, you need to be doing this. You need to be figuring out, are we building the right things? It feels like this sometimes. This is me working with my clients, and hopefully uh, this is the, the reaction that, that they will realize. So how can we get out of this? And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today. And my name is Joakim Sundén. Uh, I'm uh, from Sweden, um, Uppsala, north of Stockholm. And I am a consultant at CRISP, a small boutique consultancy uh, with lots of experience in agile transformations, coaching, training, and so on. Um, I joined them in 2017. Before that, I was six and a half years at Spotify, where I worked as an agile coach from eight to 10 teams, 2011, to more than 200 teams in 2017. And where we took an approach to software development that was all about how can we know that we're building the right thing? And then we tried to scale it, uh, which uh, later became known as the Spotify model. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it. I'm also the co-author of a book, as mentioned. And uh, if you have any questions uh, that we can't fit into this or you'd rather take at another point, you have my contact uh, information over there. So do you know what this is? It's one of the first cars, right? In the, from the 1800s, late 1800s. This is a modern car. You know what, what, what car it is? A Tesla, yeah. If you compare how the first car has evolved into this one, that's you know, basically practically self-steering and updating itself, uh, wireless uh, and so on, it's a pretty big change. This one. One of the first phones. What's happened since the late 1800s? Well, it's basically a computer with access to all the world's information and everyone in the world you can reach and, and communicate with, and it's yeah, amazing. Another thing from the late 1800s, an org chart. Wow, let's see how that's evolved until today. <laughs> Colors. Wow, it's so pretty, much nicer than the old one. 
And uh, you probably heard Nils before me. Uh, and the reason why it kind of still works is probably because these days we have the informal networks uh, going around or circumventing the, the formal structures. But it would probably be easier if we uh, didn't have those structures stopping us to start with. And this is Ford's assembly line. And they had the, this very hierarchical way of working. If you smiled on the assembly line, you could get fired. It's not supposed to be fun to work here. And they could get away with it because it was so easy. Work was standardized. Managers were the best at telling you, this is how you should be doing work. It was individual, so you were doing your thing only. It was objective, what the progress was making. Are you doing it the right thing, I can, in the right way? I can see. Oh, now you're taking an uh, illegal break. That's not good. I could immediately inspect the result. It seems to be, you, yes, you produced this widget. But today's work, that has none of those properties. It's very rarely individual. The manager is not the best person to figure out how you should be solving a problem, or, or they don't have access to the same information and context and so on as you do. And it's highly subjective. Are we done? Is this good enough? Uh, is this the right solution? Should we continue to put some more work into it? Uh, did we actually do the wrong thing? We don't know. So the management model of the 1800s won't work for the 2000s. But then, 20, 25 years ago, this came along. You recognize this group of people. It's taken from the Agile Manifesto webpage, where a, a group of men uh, met uh, to uh, agree on what to call the lightweight methodologies they were currently all uh, applying. And this really changed things, uh, as all of you know, sitting here today. But what did it actually change? So this is uh, from Klaus Leopold. There's a long way to think something up and actually deploy it and have it work. And we're focusing a lot on this small part and saying, yay, we're so fucking agile because we have a scrum team or a development team. But at the same time, we built an organization of silos, typically separating the customer, the business, or product from the vendor or the person, the order taker, the, the delivery mechanism, IT, technology, engineering, whatever you want, want to call it. We apply the same pattern, basically, as we do in the free marketplace. The customers negotiate, they want things, and they haggle, and they can we get it done faster, and to a cheaper price, and, and if you're in a business IT setup, uh, these people are typically pretty good at negotiating, and, and the people on the other side, they might not be, and they're trying to, say, protect their business and, and give a price and an estimate that they can live with. But it breaks down because if this was on the free market, you know, if, if the customer is an a asshole, uh, you can just say, I don't want your business. No, that's, I can't do that. That's uh, unrealistic. But you can't. You're trapped. On the other hand, the business side, the customer, they can't turn to anyone else either. So if they're saying, no, we can't, and it will be so expensive, and you know, what can they do? And if they negotiate and win, we have to do it by this time and deadline. And they feel like, yes, we won. We got a promise out of them. But we're all in the same organization. How can you be you know, winning and someone else losing? So if you want to look more into that, it's a customer vendor anti-pattern by Jeff Patton. And you all recognize this probably traditional hierarchical organization where you know, top management try to control things by having long-term projects, detailed budgets, toll gates, mid-management uh, exercise control by looking at is the delivery on plan? Is it on time? Is it on budget? Is it on scope? Because the actual results, they have no influence over. They don't have any responsibility of that, typically. Someone else has decided that this must be done. And work is divided into silos. We have increased the specialization in the organization. And now we have the different functions and lots of handovers. Collaboration becomes really hard. 
There's no really feedback in the sense, is, is this working or not? The only thing we can say, are we on plan? No, probably. And this is unfortunately often replicated in the Agile team or in the Scrum team, where we have a product owner and uh, a delivery team that kind of also uses this customer vendor anti-pattern. At Spotify, my colleague called it uh, the product owner as a gatekeeper. So we have all this product context and customer context and the designer, if you're lucky to have one, and the product owner, they're out there and talking to users and understanding the market and so on. And then what do they do with all this context? Typically, they translate it into orders or backlog items, specifications, requirements, and so on, which creates pretty low empathy with the end user or customer from the team. It's far removed from them, and it's often to the point where they don't know what they're churning out these widgets for, really. And low engagement uh, follows on that. We have IT teams serving the business. In the words of Marty Kagan, uh, author of books Inspired and Empowered, uh, Silicon Valley product group, he's a big product guru. He talks about delivery teams not cross-functional, basically just a bunch of developers, a backlog administrator, product owner, backlog secretary, some people call it, and, and it's all about output. Are we shipping the specification? Are we delivering the feature? They're not, they're not empowered to make any decisions really about what are we building, is it the right thing? They're just there to code and ship. Maybe you have a feature team, you have usually a little bit more cross-functional and product manager, owns the list, they can rearrange priorities and they can work out some details maybe with a designer. But typically, all output still, shipping the features, and backlog often decided by sales has had closed this deal, you just have to do it, or we have this project, the requirements have already been sorted out broadly, you can figure out the details. And Marty, by the way, in his book, has the same conclusion as uh, in the introduction. At least half of our ideas are just not going to work. Really good teams assume that at least three quarters of the ideas won't perform like we hope they would. So what can we do? Well, it's no secret what great companies do. There's lots of great product companies out there that, who create awesome products that we love and use a lot. And uh, some of the things that I learned at Spotify from 2011 is how to work in, in this sort of way with empowered product teams, where teams are involved in figuring out what should we be doing. We brought in Jeff Patton early on in 2011, the author of User Story Mapping, who was a partner with Marty Kagan and, and his book Inspired that came out in 2008 describing these ways of product discovery with the whole team and having engineering and product and, and UX uh, collaborating. Lean Startup, we read that and we applied it. And what's common uh, with these books, and yeah, Lean UX came out in 2013, uh, Gothelf. These all have in common that they describe good practices that were all, had already been existed existing and, and had been used in great product companies for quite some time. So it, was, it wasn't even new back then. And we took them to heart, we applied them, we also had collaboration with Facebook and Google and Amazon, we had people joining Spotify from these companies at an early stage. Uh, Rochelle King came from Netflix as a director of design and built this UX uh, um, department and, and really emphasizing these things. But then, when I came out of Spotify in 2017, I knew that Spotify was kind of a front runner and, and that we were pushing the boundaries a little bit. Uh, but still, you know, we, we learned that a lot of things that we assumed would be, you know, this is a great feature. When we tested it, no, there's so many counterintuitive truths. Every developer who came into Spotify was like, oh, I have a great idea of how to simplify things. I, I can't, I don't understand why you haven't done this earlier. And it turns out we did. We tried it several times. It's actually not better. I was like, what? Uh, so I assumed that, you know, 
others must be testing or trying their ideas and so on outside of Spotify as well. This is how we do it now, right? Years have gone by, and then I come out and it's like, it's as if time have, stu have stood still. So I also connected with Steve Denning of the Learning Consortium. Steve Denning is a writer for Forbes. He was a director at the World Bank, came from the traditional management and, and fell into you know, IT and the Agile movement and was astonished by how different it was. He wrote the book Radical Management and I invited him to a conference in Stockholm over 10 years ago. And later was involved when he got on the board of Scrum Alliance he still went to these general management conferences and they were like, we can't learn anything from IT. You know, that's the cost center in the basement. It's almost like our toilet paper supplier contacted us and said, we need to change because they're changing how they work. Why would we? It's ridiculous. But as software started eating the world and the big tech giants, they were all doing this in a similar way or in a different way from, from, from the rest of the companies. So he said, let's actually study what both companies born Agile, like Spotify, Riot Games, and so on are doing, but also companies that have done successful transformations in at least parts of the organization, parts of Microsoft, Ericsson, Barclays, a 300-year-old bank. And I was part of these study tours. We studied different companies for one week on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, one in Europe uh, in, in several years. And uh, what we found that really differentiated these great product companies over Agile was succeeding was these three laws, as Steve has, has formulated them. The law of the small team, the law of the customer, and the law of the network. So what's different between these companies and the rest, or many of us, is how they actually build and deploy using small agile teams, breaking down things into small parts, being able to continuously deploy several times a week, several times a day even. And this is where Scrum has its home. And this is where Scrum can be really, really great and help you do really great things. I often view Scrum, if you look at Netflix, Google, Spotify, and these companies, they, they almost never talk about Scrum. They rarely even talk about Agile. Well, Spotify is maybe the exception. But they still work in a very Agile way. How come? It's because they can deliver, deploy, test things really, really frequently. Scrum is awesome when you can't. <laughs> because it's basically saying, wouldn't it be great if we could, every two weeks, we would be able to show a real product increment that we've built together in a collaborative way, focusing on the most prioritized things, and be able to release that to, to actual users or demo it in front of stakeholders. That's a great step forward for many companies. And when you try to do that as if it was real, you're going to surface a lot of problems, as, as Nils pointed to in, in his keynote. And that will, Scrum will show you that and you will be able to address them. But if you're already really great at deploying and releasing and testing things and you have access to customers and so on, then it, it won't matter as much. So that's why you don't hear them talk about Scrum. And then when we go to the law of the customer, the extreme customer focus that's often existing in these companies, not only words, every company says they're customer focused, but then they build a siloed organization to show that they don't mean anything by that, where the internal workings of the organization are more important than actually focusing on the customer. So it, it's a difference in how we solve problems in these organizations. And the law of the network, as Nils so, uh, uh, was so great at showing, both how do we decide which problems to solve it's not the manager telling you, you should do this, you should do that. It's not the project that decides. Uh, someone else has come up with things. This is worth solving, this is not. Oh, we just closed a sales deal, so we have to do this. And this also changes how leaders and managers work to get this going and to support its, its ongoing success. So, Martin Kagan agrees, by the way. And he's, he's been working as a product uh, CPO at eBay and Netscape and worked with a lot of Silicon Valley companies. And he says exactly this. It's no secret how they work. In most companies, technology teams exist to serve the business. It's a cost of doing the real business. 
But in strong product companies, the purpose of the product team is to serve customers by creating product, products that the customers love. And yet works for the business. It still should make us money, of course. So it's going away from this traditional hierarchical organization, flipping the pyramids, flipping the organization, as Neil said, and have an empowered network organization where you have cross-functional teams, self-organizing, empowered product teams, collaborating in between them, there are no silos, everyone can talk to anyone in this network organization. And management can now focus on what's the vision, what are the goals, what's the strategic context here, what are some insights that will help you on the way. And on servant leadership, really developing people, hiring the right people, developing the, those people, and uh, on deblocking teams. And this is also something that really stands out as a difference between the big tech, for instance, and, and the, the great product companies. Uh, a manager of product owners, a product lead, a product manager in safe terms, for instance, if you talk to safe, they spend maybe 80% of their time staffing and coaching their people, not talking to customers and dreaming up things for them to do. And in many organizations uh, that I will signify as the rest, in, in many large bureaucratic organizations, it's almost no time spent. It's not even 20%, it's not even the opposite. It's very limited time on, on actually growing and developing people. Yes, and we have transpar transparent information flowing both ways because we discover new things, actual results with customers and users all the time, and we feed that back to the top, so to speak, and uh, informs what's the new strategy, what's the new direction, what are some new goals now uh, uh, with the new information that we have. And moving away from these to empowered product teams, cross-functional, focused on and measured by outcome, and empowered to come up with solutions that work, and responsible for the business results. And if you're, if you're not aware of the difference, or even if you are, maybe it's a repetition. So it's easy to see lots of user needs, pain points, problems, uh, um, improvements we can do, which gives us ideas on, yes, we can build this product, this feature, this enhancement. Sometimes they all, all too quickly turn into specifications, captured requirements, and now that's becoming the old, old of the focus, or are we delivering the feature? But wait a minute, we, we wanted to change the world, right? We wanted to change how the users behave, the customers. We want them to subscribe more, engage more with the, with, with the app, or ultimately leading to better brand recognition, more revenue, and so on. So we should maximize outcome, minimize output. The activities, epics, features, stories, whatever you call it in your organization, that's how we believe that we are reaching these outcomes. That's what they should be about. What outcome will that, this actually achieve? How will this change anything in the world? In the internal world or ideally in the external world from the organization's point of view? They are just hypotheses or bets. At Spotify, I explicitly call them bets to constantly remember that we're only placing bets. We really don't know. We have to be lucky. We have to be conservative how, how we place our bets, sometimes. Uh, and these have to change if the numbers aren't improving, because as you've seen, we're, we're not that good at, at guessing what bets uh, will actually be the good ones. So this means we need to move away from opinions to data. The old, we're working on X because Sam or the project said it's important. We're done when Sam is okay with it or when the specification is fulfilled. No, we're working on X because we think it's going to give impact Y, which matters to Spotify or, or your organization because of Z. We are done when the metrics have moved. How quickly can we learn that what we're doing is probably the wrong thing? And what options do we have in our back pocket when we, for when we discover that? Because that is the probability, as you could see earlier. Hmm, how quickly can we disprove this idea so we can move on to the next one? We don't, we don't want to build you know, operational build software to be able to prove or disprove an idea. So we need to watch the metrics throw away and try something else. 
or as Google would put it, let data drive decisions, not the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. No. Yay, option B it is. So this is moving away also on the team level from the product owner as a gatekeeper to the product manager, as some now want to call it. Product owner is only part of their job, a role that they fulfill in an agile team or a scrum team. But you should really view it as a product manager, a facilitator and collaborative leader, facilitating this context. So when you're out there talking and understanding the product context, uh, customer context and all this information, how can I make it accessible to the team? How can I make it more easily digestible? How can I pick out what stands out and inform them, this is what we're hearing, this is what we're seeing in behaviors, this is our understanding of their needs. And if you don't understand exactly, I have, have an example here from a team at Spotify that was working on onboarding. So the product manager would maybe show a slide on, okay, this is what we see in the metrics. Engineers, they would have access to all the metrics. They could build their own dashboards and dive deep into this. But we would assume that the product manager has more time, has the skills, uh, and, and uh, can work together with product analysts maybe or, or user researchers to figure out what's, let's pick out what actually stands out. And then draw con some conclusions. Hmm, we see that eight percentage points of registrations drop out. To improve, we should optimize friction, blah, 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 blah. Describing a problem we need to solve. Not saying, ah, I went and looked at the data and talked to the customers. This is what we're going to build, build it. No, given this, what should we be trying next? Or when doing user research, talking to customers with a user researcher, for instance, well, the engineers, they could probably join, sit in on the call, or, or watch the video in, in afterwards. But they would work together to facilitate this context. What stood out? What are the most important key takeaways, according to us? And this means that the product manager is a collaborative leader. They need to take all these things into consideration. Is it valuable? Understand how our organization is making money, the vision and the strategy, and so on. Is it usable? understand the users, identify their problems and the solutions and design and prototype and test that. But also, what's feasible? How do we code it? How do we fit it with legacy systems? What are the tech trends? Lots of intangible aspects that I don't know about. And often when we bring all these three together, new ideas emerge. The engineers are working every day with new technology that makes innovation possible. They know it best. So it's in the intersection of these three that great products are made. So you really need to be that collaborative leader. If you're just using your engineers to code, you're mostly getting maybe half of their value. And Marty Kagan has said several times that uh, the best single source for engineer innovation is your engineers because they're working with enabled technology every day, and, and they're in the best position to say what's just now possible that the product manager didn't even know, that the customers didn't know to be asking for. I don't know if you're familiar with Bill Campbell, the trillion dollar coach. He led a very anonymous life. I uh, didn't want anyone to write about him or talk about him, but he died a few years back, and, and then uh, the C former CEO of Google, together with some others, wrote a book he was the coach of Steve Jobs, the coach of Eric Schmidt uh, and Larry at Google, uh, at Apple and Facebook. He says that empowered engineers are the single most important thing that you can have in a company. And that influenced a lot of the big tech firms. And speaking about that, a, a lot of great products that, that we use came from engineers. It's that I do. Uh, I got up last morning and said, good morning, Alexa. I hope I didn't trigger any, anyone. Alexa, good morning, I mean. Amazon Alexa, an engineer that came up with it. Uh, I used Google Translate when I came here last, late last night to understand what science said, an engineer that came up with that. I listened to a new song in my Spotify Discover Weekly. Engineers came up with that. Even though the CEO thought it was a disastrous idea and knew about it, and everyone wanted to stop it which is another talk that I've done. You can check my website if you're interested in that pretty cool story. And speaking about the, the Bing and Microsoft example we saw earlier, 
in 2012, there was an engineer working at Microsoft who had an idea that we should display the ads a little bit differently in, in the search results of Bing. Uh, but none of the product managers thought it was worth doing. There were hundreds of ideas that could be, they could be doing. So it never, for six months, it lay there and, and uh, uh, actually never happened. But then another engineer realized we can do a very simple controlled experiment, an A-B test, to test this. And it turned out to be a success. It uh, increased revenue more than $100 million in only the US that year. Because the engineer was empowered to actually test it and prove that it was right. OK, so it's easy to say, you know, give them problems, figure out how. Uh, but unfortunately, we often end up in this situation, in large organizations in particular, the air sandwich. You know, it's a clear vision and direction on the top. Yeah, we worked a lot on our vision and direction this year. And for the people on the floor, it's clear how the day-to-day -day work is done and what needs to be done. But then in between, what we want and how, there's just, you know, the meat in the sandwich is gone. It's just air, and we don't understand how what we're doing day to day is connected. And we end up uh, in a situation like this. Okay. Whoops, sorry. Okay, let's try it again. This is where all our work is done. So what are you going to do with all these underpants that you steal? Collecting underpants is just phase one. Phase one, collect underpants. So what's phase two? Hey, what's phase two? Phase one, we collect underpants. Yeah, 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 but what about phase two? Well, phase three is profit. Get it? I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. Oh, I get it. No, you don't, fat ass. Yeah, it's a, a wonderful example of the air sandwich at work. You know, we know what the goal is, we know what we do day to day, but, you know, we can't seem to connect the dots. So, in the network organization, leaders need to focus a lot on transparency and communication. Because even though the goal is clear, we need to cross the river. If we don't communicate clearly, and if we can't connect this to what's going on and communicate in order to collaborate, we run the risk of building several different things that won't actually work together. Or in the words of Google, please find a solution with the information we're comfortable sharing with you. You need to default to open, sharing as much information as possible with your employees. And that's an example that we did at Spotify, where we defaulted to open all Google documents, all calendars, everything open. When Spotify had their strategy days with the 60 to 70 most senior uh, leaders at the company that got together for a week, not only did they share all the slide decks, they recorded all the sessions, including the Q&A, shared it with everyone in the entire company. That's the level of transparency that you need uh, to really be able to leverage empowered engineers and empowered teams. And just to give you an idea what this strategic context looks like, well, of course, a clear and compelling vision, a product strategy that ensures focus, that people are working on the most important things, business goals and, and connected product objectives that give people clear statements of a problem to solve and the solutions to strive for, and how they can connect that to what's necessary for the organization, the important objectives and metrics. And this is uh, one piece that's unfortunately often missing, but it's vital to great product companies. User research and analytics that provide people with key insights that help shape uh, strategy. So before we wrap up, it's actually this one is so important that I, I want to give an example. I guess most of you know Slack, so, so it's a, a good example. Um, and maybe you know that uh, the, mecha the mechanics of Slack works like this. When, when, you, when you want to start a Slack, you uh, go to the website, you create you know, Joachim's uh, Slack dot Slack dot com, you create a workspace. Uh, and it's now, you know, uh, you, so you, just, you complete that form, there are a few more things to fill out, and then you're done. Now you have a Slack workspace where you can chat and integrate with other things and so on. 
But everyone, for everyone, or if you look at all people who actually register a workspace, over 90% of them never use it. So Slack realized when they're looking at these metrics, we're great at leading the horse to the water, but we can't seem to be uh, getting the, the horse to drink it. So what can we do? And they, they analyzed their numbers and realized that there seems to be a common denominator uh, of people engage with Slack. As soon as you send more than 2,000 messages on Slack, whether you're a 10-people organization or a 5,000-people organization, as soon as you're over 2,000 messages, 93% who do that are still there a year later or, or even longer. So that's a, an example of a strategic or product insight that if then what can we do now to help push people to that? How can we help them get to that point? At Spotify, we realized it was two-week retention. If you keep coming back the second week from when you downloaded Spotify, we got you for life, more or less. So what can we do? How can we onboard people, remind them, get them to come back? For Airbnb, I heard it was uh, at, at an early stage, if you have more than 10 photos of, of your, uh, uh, your rental, it's a much higher probability that you will be able to, to, to get someone to, to go for it. So they actually sent out professional photographers for free to help people, just to bump them up and activate them. Yeah, so uh, some, uh, that's uh, just an example and, and some work that leadership needs to do to re truly empower teams and, and, and people. But in summary, great product companies work in a different way compared to most companies. It's not about Scrum necessarily, as we talked about. It's about a difference in how they build and deploy software, which I guess has to do uh, with Scrum or could have to do, but also how they solve problems giving empowered product teams problem to solve, sharing the strategic context and information they need, deciding how they decide which problems to solve, informed by a product vision, by key insights and a sound strategy, not by project lists or, or sales driven. And this changes how we lead and manage teams and people, really being servant leaders, creating the system and environment that Nils was talking about, and developing people. As Toyota said, we don't build cars, we build people who build cars. At Spotify, we built people who built music streaming services. And most of you probably don't work like this, but the good news is it's no secret how others do it, and you can learn how to do it too. And if you're in doubt, I have courses, Chris Brown's courses, so feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, can we pull up the question slide? No oh. questions. So either everything is understood or nothing is understood. What we can do is, do you have any questions right on the spot? Maybe not asking via via the app, but somebody would like to ask a question. At the w back, of course. Wait for the mic. Know. Maybe some elevator music while I get you the mic. Uh, wh what is your favorite app you are using currently? Sorry, my favorite app? Yeah, on the phone or in general. Oh, wow, uh, interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm so bad at choosing the number one and making lists, so I could never be a good product owner, backlog administrator, I guess, uh, prioritizing things just uh, out of that. So it, I would say it depends on context, which is a very consultant answer to say. So uh, recently I've been playing a lot of FIFA, so I love the Footbin app. That's the one I use heavily to check out new players and stats and comparing them. Uh, but uh, I also use LinkedIn a lot in my work, boringly enough. Uh, but of course, if I had to pick one, I would have to go with Spotify, right? So non-biased non response, Spotify. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you very much. I saw somewhere here somebody would like to ask a question. So why did you leave Spotify and what did you do there? So, sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Why did you leave Spotify and what <laughs> did you do there? Uh, at Spotify, I was an agile coach. Uh, one of the first, I worked together with the CTO and uh, some other coaches and managers in the early days to come up with a new approach, uh, how we could be doing this still. We called it autonomous squads, what Marty Kagan later would call empowered product team. I was holding on to autonomous squad for a long time, but it seems like you know, he's a bigger name than we are, and, and uh, you know, let's go with empowered product team. But it's autonomous squads at Spotify is exactly the same. I was part of, of you know, trying to scale the organization in a way that could keep that and not add too much bureaucracy in the wrong way called tribes and squads and chapters and so on. I worked with leadership teams and squads, uh, dozens of them in, in San Francisco, Boston, Stockholm, and New York. And when I moved back from the US, uh, you know, it, I, I was first thinking, what will I be doing at Spotify in Stockholm? But I came to this moment, you know, life-changing, moving to a new country or old country. Uh, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I've noticed a diminishing return of investment on, you know, change at Spotify. A lot of great people come very far. And realizing when I go out to conferences, feeling embarrassed that I'm just stating the obvious. And people are like, wow, this is amazing. How can you do that? Tell us more. And I was like, whoa, really? Wow, cool. Maybe I can help other organizations uh, uh, in a better way than just sticking around at Spotify. And so. one more question here. Can somebody? Nice with these personal questions. I really good. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is general. It's not uh, personal. So you mentioned uh, Scrum and beyond. How can we improve uh, our work, like people, like teams? And uh, your previous speaker, he mentioned some things like uh, some words that uh, sucks, that uh, are not good, like, uh, and we saw this list of a lot of words like accountable, goals, uh, commitment, engagement, and we know that this uh, diversity of opinions is okay in Agile, but what do you think when we have such a people in our team that said accountable sucks and all these things that are part of Scrum, how can we uh, make these teams better? How can we go by beyond Scrum? Right, okay, so then it's more like how can we make the team want to adopt some Scrum practices or, uh, yeah, so um, what has been working best for me is, uh, you know, generally trying to focus on outcomes uh, and objectives. So, so why are we using Scrum? Well, if we can figure that out and if we can get leadership around the team to agree on that, so it's not just a you know, scrum master or agile coach who, who talk about these things because you know, it's their job. Of course, they're gonna go on about how we should be doing this, but they don't seem to have any skin in the game. My manager is talking about other things. The product manager are talking about different things. And then I also have this, you should work in this way, but it's my ass if this turns out to not be working. So you need to, to shape this vision of why are we doing this? So all leaders start asking and paying an interest to that. And then saying maybe we, we need to be faster because of these and these and these reasons. Or we need to satisfy our customers more. We need to be more innovative. And we believe currently that this agile practice or this thing will actually help us do this. And this is how we believe it will take us there. And ideally, this is how we can follow up that it's actually happening. Basically the same approach as I described to, to product development, right? Because then it, then it also becomes their responsibility. That you, can, you can easily be against Scrum, against stand-ups, but can you be against uh, customer satisfaction, against being faster, against raising quality? Probably not, that's a more difficult conversation. So now the, it, the onus becomes on them. Okay, so if you don't think we should do that, team stand-up, what ideas do you have? What practice do you suggest then to push these metrics to, to get more customer satisfaction and so on? You can comply or explain. As long as you have a better idea, better explanation, and we can measure that, great. 
And then, of course, the oldest trick in the book is let's just try this as an experiment for you know, X number of weeks. Uh, but then, uh, unfortunately, most people stop there, and you should set up what do we think will happen? What can we see? What can we learn? And then you will, you will hopefully kindle an interest even with the most introvert engineer. Ah, hmm, I can prove something wrong or right. And if it's not working, hmm, that's an interesting problem. How can I solve this differently? And try to engage them in, in that. So sorry, basically the same thing as empowered product teams, you would say empowered scrum, uh, scrum masters. Thank you very much, Jörgen. Okay, thank you. I'm here all day and next day, so hopefully take your questions whenever.